Perfect. All right, so I'm Brandon Heller. I'm one of the co-founders of Forward Networks. Uh, I lead engineering here. And like you heard, three years ago at Networking Field Day, we effectively launched the company. And since then, a lot has changed. We've gone from smaller test deployments to a lot of really huge production deployments. And we want to tell you about some of the lessons we've learned from those, especially around APIs today. So quick show of hands, who prefers demos to slideware? Why are you here? Just kidding. No one actually raised their hand. No one, no one kept it down. Um, we like demos too. And it's not just because of short attention spans from the YouTube era. It's because what we have is, is real content that we want to show you. And I think it's going to be really engaging. So feel free to jump in with any questions that you've got. We've added some time in each session for a few questions, plus a little bit of extra time at the end. Um, in fact, we have five presenters today. Um, I'm going to be walking through uh, what Forward does, getting everyone on the same page with a UI demo. Uh, then Shiva, who's one of our principal engineers, is going to walk you through API integrations that we've done hand in hand with customers. He's going to show you a demo of a Slack bot. Fabrizio, who's our director of technical marketing, is going to give a demo of closed loop automation. Sounds similar to one I heard you might have seen earlier today, but we've got our own spin on it. Then Nikhil, who's one of our co founders, is going to release a new feature today for the first time. Um, this is pretty cool, and I, I think you'll like it. Uh, and then Natalia, is gonna, who's our director of product, is going to kind of zoom out a bit and talk about some considerations for the product. Any questions? All right, let's get started. All right, so the networks we see on a daily basis, these are large, complex beasts. The networks that we deal with are things like large financial networks, internet service provider networks, retail networks. Uh, we've, we're even seeing a bunch of government networks today. And in all of these networks, the challenge of effective network operations is really that of dealing with all of the embedded complexity that has arisen over time. So that means the diversity of vendors, that means the huge number of devices that we see, and it means a number of device types that seems to just increase over time, from the traditional switches, routers, and load balancers, to virtual devices at the edge, to increasingly virtual devices in the cloud. So to effectively operate a modern enterprise network, there are a few things that you have to do. First steps are simply to know what you have and how it's connected. Short word for this is having a map. A lot of our customers don't have an up-to-date map, and this is a good starting place. Once you have a map, you can start to answer the higher level questions, things like, well, where's the traffic actually going to handle that trouble ticket or start to infer what you might need to change. But to even understand where traffic is going in many cases, you've got to have a deep understanding of the protocols, and you've got to have access to all this green text behind you, right? All of the state outputs, all the configuration, all the stuff that defines the behavior of the network, both in general as well as right now. All right, let's say you've figured out where traffic is going. Raising up a level, it's, is that network working? Does it have the connectivity, the isolation, and the fault tolerance properties that meet your actual intent? Simple to pose, is the network working, yes or no? It's extremely hard to answer today, especially with all of this information. And then the last thing here is, well, what do you change? Where do you make a change? What is it that you change? Is that change the right one? That's another challenge of operations that we see in networks at this scale. So let's make this a little more concrete. So we recently went to uh, a chunk of, to an enterprise uh, Fortune 500 kind of network, pretty standard. It, it fits in our customer mix. We only got to see a fraction of that network, and a fraction of that network is 12,786 devices. So our collection software went out, it grabbed all the configurations, and it ran all of the commands in the CLI that we knew of that would tell us what that device was thinking. In other words, all the state outputs, things like IP routes, ARP tables, uh, VLAN status tables. So let's, let's do a show of hands. Raise your hand if you think there were at least a million lines of text accumulated from the config and the, the CLI outputs. It's at pretty least. reasonable, right? At least, at least a million. At least. All right, 10 million. Do I have 10 million? 10 million. Do I have 100 million? 100 million, 100 million. OK, in the back, 100 million. Do I have a billion? <laughs> Going once. Going twice. Uh -huh. Sold for a billion. OK, you're all wrong. Uh, 3 billion. Holy. Oh, wow. Ow. It's a lot. 3.28 billion lines of text. And this isn't even the whole network. Right? That's the crazy thing. And that actually undersells the complexity. Because this is a network undergoing hundreds of changes every week. Those three billion lines are just one tiny snapshot. And this is a network that has a lot of snowflakes. We counted 514 unique model and firmware combinations in just this chunk of the network.
So going back to those things you need to know to have effective network operations on the left, all of those are about getting a behavioral understanding of your network. But if the behavior of your network is encoded in three billion lines of text, then one can imagine how hard it is at that scale to handle network operations. So we think a fundamentally different approach is needed that enables people to raise their level of abstraction at which they operate with the net, they interact with the network. All right, so this is where forward networks comes in. Uh, we took these challenges and we solved them using smart software. So to solve those first few challenges here, we created a search module. What do you do when you have an overwhelming amount of data? You index it and you build a search engine. And that can include access to configuration, as well as access to state, as well as the more interesting and unique piece for us, which is access to an entire set of all behaviors in that network. So search gives you fast, easy to use, uh, search over all possible network behaviors. Once you can find stuff, you wanna know if your network is working in the way that you expect. So we've created an ability to continuously validate a variety of constraints, connectivity, security, and configuration sanity constraints to represent them in simple and understandable and communicatable ways in this verify module. And you'll see this shortly in a demo. The third bit we have is prediction. And right now this is largely around ability to say, if I change this firewall rule, what's going to happen to my traffic next? Are there chunks of the network that it's gonna to go to and then stop? Are there other firewalls that traffic's gonna reach? What happens both, does my change have an effect? Does my change have the right effect? And does it have no unintended effects? All right, so how do we do it? How do we make this possible? Well, we go out to heterogeneous network infrastructure, to the switches, to the routers, the load balancers, and any uh, firewalls, either virtual or physical, uh, on premises or in the cloud. We grab all the data we can, all the stuff from the CLI or in a few cases, different interfaces that are a little more modern, a little more optimized, and we put it all in one place. And once we have all of the data for the entire network in one place, we can start to analyze it to figure out behavior. How do we do that? Well, we build a mathematical network model. This is precise. And we start out with individual devices. So a network model says, if a packet comes into a device, where does it go next? Which ports, <coughs> port or no ports at all, does it come out of? How does it get transformed as it exits those ports? Or if it gets dropped, where is it getting dropped and why? It explains behavior in that moment of time for a single device. And once you have all of the single device models, you can combine them with your knowledge of the network map. The LLDP and CDP outputs you can connect together. We have some ways of inferring those connections and if there's no way to infer or to discover, you can provide that as well. So once we've got a map of the individual devices, we can start to understand behavior at a network-wide level. How do we do that? Well, we depend on something called header space analysis, and this was the result of one of our founders, Payman Kazemian, doing his PhD at Stanford. And header space analysis is pretty cool because it was the first algebra for representing a wide array of network types and all those different devices that I mentioned inside them in a consistent way, such that you could analyze really large networks. And when I mean analyze networks, I mean find absolutely every path through that network. Find all the places where traffic enters a loop, where it gets dropped, or where it goes all the way through, including places where traffic comes, gets split, and then it joins again, and it finds its way for things like ECMP routing. So this mathematical network model predicts behavior. You can think of it as a software copy of your network or a digital twin. Whatever the digital pr twin predicts is what should be happening on that, on that real network. This is the core concept of what we do, making data available from that network model in understandable ways. And we do that through those three applications you just heard about, search, verify, predict, as well as an API that's gonna be the focus of the rest of today, about other ways to integrate that information into workflows. So this is, uh, I, just, I just wanna take a second and explain how insane this is, because there are three really hard problems that you have to solve. First problem is you have to understand the behavior of the world's diversity of networking devices, all of their firmware versions, all of their little iterations, individually as well as together. So if you can solve that daunting problem, only then can you start to build a model and, and try to expose the results. Second hard problem is analyzing networks with 10,000 devices in a single view. We learn very quickly that if you do just a chunk of a network, you don't have complete results. And if a company is gonna adopt a platform like this, they want it all, at the very beginning. They wanna go wide because that's where the value is strongest. You wanna know for any traffic that's gonna come into that network, not that it's going into someone else's silo, but here's all the way that it's going through the network, all the way to the end host. 
Third challenge is providing instant access to all of that network behavior because you're competing with the CLI. You're competing with a friendly uh, method of accessing that information that people know how to use very well. You've got to be so much better that they choose to use you. So here's where we are now. We have support for hundreds of firmware versions. We test them every night. Uh, we've got a colo in Santa Clara where we've got racks of real devices as well as virtual devices as well. We're constantly testing those firmware versions. We've reached a point of support for a majority of today's deployed networking equipment. That's how I'd phrase it. That includes 31 unique OSs. Is it five or six from Cisco? It's a bunch. All right, uh, second thing, uh, where we are in terms of scaling. This is arguably the, the hardest problem, right? Because average developers can't do this. You've, you've got to get people who know how to implement search engines, really think about distributed system scaling and all the micro-optimizations you need. We're at a point to where today we can do a network with about 10,000 devices uh, on a roughly $10,000 server in under an hour. And after that processing phase, access is instant. And this is a number we're constantly driving down. We're trying to get closer to minutes. We're trying to reduce also the size of the server that you need. And this has been happening over time. In fact, it's been happening roughly at an order of magnitude performance improvement every year for the last four years. Last thing is, we're at a point to where we have a GUI that requires no manual. It has to be easy, right? No one wants to use software that requires a manual, and I think we're just about there. And not only that, it provides sub-second results for paths of lengths 20, 25, even 30 hops in networks of 10,000 devices, which is, it wasn't easy. All right, so zooming out a little bit, what we do is build a pipeline that takes data from your network on the left and turns it into a behavior database that you can access through an API. So I'm going to show you what access through that API looks like through our modern web app that directly uses the API. And in the rest of today, you're going to see demos about API integrations. All right, demo time. All right, I'm going to load this up and show you what you'd see in the forward networks interface. All right, let me refresh this. All right, and I'll just use this chair. Oops. Mic drop. Mic drop, yeah, not an intentional one. <laughs> okay, so this is the interface you would see uh, as a user of forward networks after an admin for forward networks had gone in, provided a list, typically CSV, but you can do it through API as well, of all the devices in your network and the list of credentials that you've got. So we go out, we figure out what the device types are given the set of credentials we've got. We build that network map for you. Uh, we automatically build an, uh, a map. In fact, uh, we could generate something kind of like this if you wanted. In this case, I've, I've laid it out by hand. Um, this is something you can edit. This is kind of step zero. This is an up-to-date map of your network where we've discovered the device types and we've pulled in that information. Question, in the collector, is there a discovery engine? Whereas we can, you know, take those LLDP, CDP neighbor tables and then start reaching into other network devices via credentials or something like that. Absolutely. So after the first collection, we show a list of discovered neighbors. Uh, we don't want to go hack your neighbors unless you give us consent. So you go ahead and just say, yep, take a look, try to connect to those, add them to the list of devices, no problem. Okay. No network has a completely accurate configuration management database that's exporting the list that we're using to seed this. Hmm. So we've definitely seen in practice how that can be useful. If you want to do a subnet scan to identify devices, you can do that as well. So there's also a question from Chris Reed on Twitter of, is there a public list of supported networking equipment and versions that you guys have published? <sighs> yes. Uh, it's on the website and we can send out the link after. Okay. We'll do that. All right, so what we've collected is, is pretty comprehensive, right? This is a random Juniper device I happen to be clicking on. We've collected its configuration as well as the full set of state outputs that we need to understand to precisely predict the behavior of that device when any packet were to arrive. So here we've got an ARP table, we've got IPv4, IPv6. Interface details are especially important. Uh, in fact, this is our demo network that includes devices from F5, Juniper, Arista, Cisco, uh, VMware Palo Alto, and this is just a small sample of what we're able to do today. So that's the day zero experience of being able to get an up-to-date map of your network to see all the information there. I can start searching for anything. I could search for the name of a VRF and we'll get autocomplete. I could start searching for an IP. 
Uh, all that stuff is at your fingertips. And if I'm not even sure what I want to search for, just click in the search bar and it'll tell you all kinds of things you can do. I can do common traffic searches, like a classic five-tuple traffic search. Maybe that's not what I want, so I'm going to clear it. I can do traffic. I can find all the ways that traffic can go from a location to every other location in my network. I can find all the places that can reach a particular destination. That would be the two operator here. I can search for all traffic that has certain forwarding statuses, like find all the MPLS traffic, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, search options. But I'm going to jump ahead and say, I'm putting on my network in Manhattan. And someone just came to me and said, we just deployed a new web application. And it seems like for secure access on the web, things are good, but we're not getting redirects. Something's wrong. Network guy, prove your innocence. Who's heard that before? So here's what you would do. Oh, we got one hand, just one person. OK. So I'm going to input that search and forward. I'm going to say, show me all traffic from an Atlanta internet port going to a web app on a public virtual IP. And maybe I know a little bit more about the traffic. Maybe I know that when they say secure web traffic, they mean HTTPS. So I'm going to add that. And as I was typing, before I had finished my complete search, we were already providing a list of all of the searchable stuff. These are facets in the same way that I can go to Amazon and say, I'm looking for a frying pan, and it'll tell me, do you want 8-inch, 10-inch, or 12-inch? Do you want copper, aluminum, or steel? This is showing attributes of traffic that I can use to filter my search. And in fact, in many cases, this is enough to answer your question, like what are the IP addresses that are even interesting that match my query? We then show the list of paths. Here we've narrowed our search down to a single path, and we're showing that in the topology view on the right side here. When we show that path, we try to highlight in the first view you see the most important stuff. Typically, the most important stuff is where is that traffic starting? Where is it going? What are all the hops along the way? And what are the places where interesting forwarding is occurring? So here, I want to know that it's starting at an Atlanta internet port. I'm probably curious about what uh, port traffic could be coming in and going out of. So all of these blue links here you see in the interface all connect me to additional information. Often that information connects me actually back to the source files from which we've built our model. And this isn't just to kind of prove where we're getting the data from. Often that can be very useful to track down problems. So for example, with an interface, I've got extra details. If I want to know where is that information coming from, I can click in the interface and get it. But if I really want to do something like see where an ECMP forwarding decision is coming from, I can click see device state. And we've seen firewalls that have 400,000 lines of config. And to focus your attention on just the one or two or even 10 lines of config that are relevant for that forwarding can save an awful lot of time because we've done all the subnet matching in advance. All right, so that's what path analysis gets us. For every path that matches a query, it gives me all the relevant details. It even highlights them. And in places where there are multiple network functions applying to that traffic, so here we've got an access control list rule that's applying. We've got a network address translation rule. We're presenting the information in an abstracted way. So what device is this? Does anyone know? I don't even remember anymore. And I don't remember because we're not showing it by default. We're focusing your attention on those core concepts that every junior network engineer can understand really well. And every senior network engineer has on the back of their hand ready to go. Things like IP addresses and NATs and, and translation rules we're making available. And we're presenting them again in vendor independent, easy to understand ways. Uh, is it OK to ask some questions? Two questions. Um, does this tie into like uh, IPAM systems that so it will actually translate IP addresses so that would help people contextualize the data? That's an interesting direction we're, we're looking at actively. Okay. But today, I don't think we have any integrations there. What you could do to enable an integration is we have this concept of objects. And objects can cover, they're basically human readable strings for entities in your network like IP addresses. So you could do an integration. Um, with an IPAM system, like here we use Efficient IP, and you could probably, I've done some API-driven automation of that before. You could probably do something like that to provide all that information here to forward. We're also looking at ways to automatically infer it from the data we already collect. OK. And do you uh, support the uh, multicast, like pulling out multicast uh, data and then treeing out multipath, uh, multicast trees? So if there are multiple paths from where you're searching, we show those. But I don't know that we have specific support for multicast. Just, do you want to add? Yeah, PIM. Yeah, that's right. So that's a yes. Awesome. This data that you're showing us, this is coming from the model that you've made, right? 
So this data is going to only be as good as the model that you made of the network that's real life. Absolutely. So we need we need an up to date model, and we need an, all the data to make that model accurate. And from the data we collect, we need to trust that the model that we show you is the right one. So I was going to ask a question, kind of, how do you keep your model fresh in terms of of how reflective it is of what the real network is? Great question. So the difference between not having instant access to your information, all of your network, 10,000 plus devices, and having it is, is pretty stark. Mm -hmm. And even if you've got a bit of delay to that information, it's still vastly faster than people. So we have some customers that start out with a cron job that every night collects everything from their network. Mm -hmm. We have one customer over 10,000 devices uh, that started out with a few hours for their collection. And just by increasing the parallelism of that collection, we were able to drive it down pretty close to an hour. And they haven't reached the limits of, of that just yet. And we're working on all kinds of ways to speed it down up even more to try to get that down to close to nothing. We've also got a method called partial collection. And partial collection, you say, here are the 10 devices I just changed, just update these. Okay. And that drives your collection time down from collecting 10,000 devices to 100 devices. And maybe the slowest device in that set of 100 takes a minute to collect. Well, now your collection time is a minute. Is, is there a way to say, I only want to collect, say, the operational state values, because I know my network <coughs> configuration hasn't changed over the last few days, but the operational states may have, you know, BGP neighbors and, you know, routing protocols and multicast neighbors and so, and so forth. Can you just ingest certain things and then, you know, make it go faster that way? Yeah, so we don't have the ability to uh, do partial collection at, at a state level granularity, but we do so for at a device level. So that's what we are doing right now, but uh, that's a great idea, something we do. We find that the configuration collection is pretty fast relative to the state, which can take a lot longer. So, yeah. And in some cases, we choose which state to collect based on the configuration we've seen to try to further optimize that process already. And in some cases where that collection may take longer, like where you might not care about seeing all the IP addresses for the internet, but just the ones that are relevant to your network, you can filter the collection for especially uh, internet routing tables where there, there could be an awful lot of information and that could slow things down. Yeah, we're, we're starting to work with vendors to reduce that time. All right, any other questions? All right, so that's, that's search in a nutshell. It's access to configuration, it's access to state, and it's access to paths. And I've focused more on paths than the other stuff, just in the interest of time. So, Just, just a quick question on the state. Are you... Yeah. Uh, what methods can you access those network devices at? Is it uh, screen scraping, show commands, uh, APIs? Um, how exactly SNMP? How exactly are you collecting that information? Right. So we want to we want a product that deploys day zero everywhere, and so we focus our uh, efforts right now on CLI. CLI, every device supports, and also we know that with CLI we can get access to all the information. Some of the other methods that we've taken a look at. Things like NetConf and, in some cases, APIs don't actually give us access to all the information we need because we need an awfully detailed amount of information. It's almost like show tech support, but really optimizing it for speed. So as additional interfaces become available, and that includes things like streaming telemetry, we're going to integrate those into the platform to reduce the collection time and improve the, the level of freshness. So, so we, yeah, obviously we treat it as optimizations. Equipment too, then. Clearly, if it's uh, CLI. Yeah, in many cases, it's, it's your only option. And a lesson we learned uh, very early on was, I think it was an Arista device that had a HTTP uh, server interface for like a version 4.12 and the customer had 4.11. And what do you do? Well, well, we had to implement the CLI support because we couldn't ask them to upgrade all their core routers just to try out our product. Yeah, generally, how long does it take for you guys to implement or, or validate a new release of code? So, like, say, Arista codes from, like, version X to version Y, and, uh, and your customer says, I've got version Y, you know, how quickly can you turn your product? So, as you might guess, this is the kind of process that affects our ability to scale as a, as a company to support the world's diversity of networking equipment. So, we invest in automation to reduce the time cost involved in that. We'd love to, on Monday, say, oh, great, you've got these three firmwares we've never seen before. Let's drop them in a bucket, let's wake up in the morning, and let's make sure that there are no issues with them. And we're basically to that point today of supplying new firmware versions. We can automatically change firmware, the uh, version we have loaded on, on some of our uh, hardware and test it out. So automation of testing is something I haven't mentioned at all yet, and it may not be the sexiest thing to talk about here, but it's one of the things that makes this whole business possible and really makes a complete set of network models possible in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, yeah. So when you do see like, okay, version Y now has 
20 configuration changes, you know, they just changed it for whatever reason. How long does it usually take for you guys to spin your product to address those changes and then, you know, bring it Right. Up? So spinning up a completely new device tends to be on the order of three to four months. It really depends on the sophistication of that device and the set of features we want to support out of the box. If it's a device that we've seen before and it's just a new firmware version, typically it's a pretty small amount of changes. Right? And if it's a new feature we've never seen before on a device we've already seen before, then the timescale tends to be on the order of a month to build out the set of tests to confirm our understanding of its behavior, to do all the testing around that to make sure the model that we're generating is correct, and then to make it available in our software. I was thinking more along the lines where they just make you know cosmetic syntax changes to you know make it better. It's not really functionally any different. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Yeah. So we do hot fi we do major releases every three weeks where we run through our complete test plan, and we do often minor releases in between to unblock customers. And if we've got an opportunity to add a patch or two here to here or there because maybe it's block and parsing or something, we can we can cut that on the order of a few days or less. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're pretty fast to turn around because that's what we need to do to to get to a complete view. Awesome. Cool. All right. So I'm going to move on to verification functionality. So let's say. Mm -hmm. Actually, I forgot a, a one thing with search I want to show you because it's interesting. All right, so let's say I looked for traffic. Let's say it was HTTP. Remember the, the setup, it was the app is working on HTTPS, but maybe HTTP is not forwarding all the way through. So I'm going to change my search. I'm going to take a look at what's happening. Does anyone see what's happening with this traffic? Where's the one word that's in red in the entire screen, right? Yeah. It's getting dropped. Here's where it's getting dropped. It's at this dirty internet edge firewall. This is the device. If I want to see the state that's relevant, I can click on that as well. There's also NAT that's getting applied here. This might have been the reason that my firewalling didn't have the intended effect necessarily, or even if I'm going to make a change, I probably should know about this. All right, so this is such a common occurrence of, well, what do I have to do next? If I fix this firewall entry, is the network going to forward my traffic to its destination? Yes or no? Do I need to forward this to the security team to make a change and then I'm done, or do I actually need to do something myself as part of a network team? We created what we call permit all mode. It's a button click away. I click it, and then yes. that purple strike through on the left side happens. We cross off the firewall entries. You would never do this on your real network, but the beauty is this is a software copy of your network. <laughs> we have some security conscious customers, and they would never do this. Um, so this says if we were to ignore those firewall entries that caused a drop, here's what would happen with that traffic. In fact, it would reach its destination all the way to an ESX vSwitch. So that permit all, is that only in the hop that previously dropped it, or is it through the entirety of the network? So if you had another set of firewalls, say, behind it, that were going to be dropping that traffic, would the map then show you stopping at that next layer, essentially? We go all the way through. We ignore the firewall entries that are blocking, and we go through all of them. So there's another one on this path as well I wanted to show you that's on the screen. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it wasn't obvious, and I brought it up. There's a second firewall uh, that we traverse on that path. <laughs> And this is part of the beauty. If, if you've got a bunch, you want to know what they all are out of the box. And in fact, Shiva is going to talk a little bit about an application that benefits from that relating to provisioning. Okay, so I've got behavior now that I want to see. Like, let's say I want to do test-driven development with my network, or let's just say I want to codify this behavior in what we call uh, an intent check. So any behavior that I've searched on, I can turn that into an intent check and make sure that that behavior applies as my network evolves, and I can directly see if it's passing or not. I'm not going to focus too much on this, but I do want to show you that I can click a button, and I can turn this into a check that makes sure that that traffic is in my network. And now in my Verify tab here, where I go for intent checks, this was for HTTP, I've now got these uh, descriptions of traffic through my network. In fact, we, we just checked and ensured that that HTTPS flow is going through my network. Uh, the HTTP traffic uh, here is not being delivered, so we've got this failed link. And if I do more complex kinds of checks, including ones that ensure that we have multiple paths, uh, those are all the kinds of things that I can represent here. In fact, there's another kind of check, a reachability check, that we've recently improved. And that reachability check, I'll go back to the search interface, uh, the reachability check ensures that from an IP range to an IP range, there are no holes in the middle. There are no ports that are getting blocked. That connectivity is full and unrestricted. There are other kinds of verification checks that we can do as well that are based on things that apply to most people's networks, like predefined checks, as we call them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I would love to show you more. But these are all examples of checks on configuration and state, or in a few cases on the actual forwarding behaviors, like no forwarding loops, where a customer came to us and they said, 
I never want to see this problem again. I want to be proactively notified if this condition is happening in my network, and I want you guys to do it for me. And we notice that a lot of these are things that apply to basically everyone. VLANs should match, MTU should match, I shouldn't have loops in my network. For routing protocols, there are certain property, basic properties that should hold. They're kind of obvious no-brainers. They're such no-brainers that we already click the button for you. We, we make them defaults the first time you create a network here. And there's another kind of check that you're going to learn more about in Nikhil's session later. So I've got a question for you. You've got a note under the BGP router ID that says this is only for NXOS devices. Is this something that you guys coded as a custom rule like that you're checking? or This is or software is that, just... that we coded up. Okay. Yeah. So... Meaning that like you've only written that template for NXOS specifically? Yeah, so over time we're expanding these to the full diversity of devices we've got. We happen right. to have a few rules in this BGP side um, that are specific to NXOS, but the majority of rules here don't have any constraints like that. Gotcha. The most commonly used ones are things like, are my port channels con consistent? Are my you know, duplexes right? right. IP addresses? I got the top one because it was like things. EPC next tops, and like that made sense for NXOS, but the loopback ID, I was just trying yeah. to understand how that, how that fits in. Yeah, we do a lot of this based on customer request, and that particular okay. customer had NXOS, and we did that first, but we're expanding this over time, of course. Okay. Great. All right, and the last quick thing I want to show about the interface, another example of uh, the closer to the customer you are, the more you see what's really useful. So this is a diff interface between any two snapshots. Mm -hmm. Configs are one way that snapshots are going to be different, but that's not where it ends. And we were on uh, a call for a change window with a bank, and 16 hours in, I remember hearing the bleariness in their eyes. You could just tell, like, the speech was starting to slur a little bit because they just wanted to go home, right? And for us, it was Pacific time, so it wasn't even nearly as late, but it was still pretty late in our night. And so what they wanted to know is, how has my network changed in a change window context? And so the diff capability builds upon the model to show you all of the differences in understandable network entities, things like interfaces and VLANs and ACLs, and presents views that are customized to that kind of, of state. So if you want to understand which VLANs were added, removed, changed, which ACLs were added, removed, or changed, and in which way, same thing with NATs, same thing with IP routes, we've got an interface to make that really easy. So is this diffing only configs, or do you, can you also diff the output of, say, you know, the show commands? Like, you know, that's the output of the show command. Exactly. So you're seeing on the screen the differences in IP routes. We've taken that vendor-specific output, we've kind of canonicalized it, and so we can show you all those differences in a single interface. This is part of the beauty that it's the exact same interface, doesn't matter which devices you're looking at. So if I'm comparing Cisco and Juniper, I'm not you know, looking at two entirely different BGP route formats, and I can look and see that exactly there, and like you said, in the same format, so I'm comparing routes. I dare you to show me something that is vendor specific in this interface right here, and that's intentional. We're trying to show things in, in a vendor independent way, exactly like you're mentioning. What about the GE namings? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, yeah. <laughs> you win that dare. Okay. <laughs> now I know you're listening. All right. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the quick UI demo. I could go on for another hour and show you all the, the details of the search interface. I could show you some of the predictive capabilities. I could show you the ways you might interact with it and its documentation. And I'm going to skip all that and just head back to our, uh, the rest of our talk. So One quick question. Yeah. Like, let's say you didn't have a network of 10,000 devices. Let's say you had a network of, say, 1,000 devices or 2,000 devices. How quickly can, can somebody set up your system and run that day zero? Like, go from, you know, push button, I get pretty, pretty thing, and I can start searching. Like, is that like an hour of my day? Is it, a, is it a day of my day? Is it something I can do by myself? You know, talk through that experience of like trying it out. That's a great question. How do I get this into my network? How much effort is it going to take? This is exactly the right question to ask a company like us because we've got to make it easy, right? And so the first half of this year, our top priority was driving down that time from the first time you try to collect from your network to where you've got all the credentials right, You've got all the devices identified, and you've got a complete map of your network, including things from neighbor discovery, subnet scans, into where we've resolved any you know, little issues that we just happen to notice on one device out of 10,000, where it's the first time we've ever seen that. So that process could be as short as same day. And in fact, even a few years ago, we had 100-ish node deployments where the first time we tried it out, it actually did work. And since then, it's gotten a lot better. And we've learned from these giant deployments how important it is to have support in the UI to make it easy to understand which devices need action of any kind, 
and what that action is. And in fact, we now have basically a wizard that walks you through here are the categories of issues we've seen and makes it really easy to act upon them in a way that you can do yourself without necessarily needing uh, forward tech support. We have to make it fast. Our goal is that same day or even that same hour. Okay, cool. Excellent. Quick question. Just out, out of the search portion of it. Because yeah, we're going to switch speakers, but um, I'm talking. Out of the search side, I was just sort of curious. Uh, is there any conditions around escape characters and everything? I mean, if you're doing V6 stuff, right, colons are delimiters for addresses, not for ports, right? So, right, you have a V4 address, colon, delimiter, it's port number, versus like for a V6 address, the delimiter is the colon itself for the address. Uh, we try to be smart about how we match uh, those colons. I'm not an expert on the search syntax for that particular question. Right, so there's, there's some yeah. interesting things around like prefix, like how you interpret prefix slash notation versus... I, I can take that question. We support IPv6 uh, colons, we handle it well. Uh, so search is search for us. We don't impose... Uh, our, our search is, as you saw, it was uh, very structured. So you enter specific fields in specific boxes. So uh, an IP address is... Uh, specified in a box and port is specified in a different box. So we don't have that problem of parsing what right. a colon could mean. All right. 